Faith Community Church presents Truth For Today. Is the Bible truly relevant to our lives today? Well, we believe that not only is it relevant, but practical, and most of all, life-changing for those who are truly seeking to answer life's questions. Have you been a victim of Adam's fall? Plagued by the curse since the moment you were born? Well, you're not alone. Seven billion other human beings suffer from the effects of sin every day. It has destroyed our relationships with family, friends, and loved ones, our connection with God, even our understanding of ourselves. It has broken planet Earth and resulted in death, violence, and destruction. But there is hope. With God's new patented design, things that have been broken by the fall can be restored once more. Introducing Redeem Now the revolutionary new cleaning agent that cleans up the mess that sin and death leave behind. With Redeem Now, lives are restored, God's truth reigns, and there is peace among mankind. Here's how it works. First, there is a heavy application of the gospel onto the affected parties, revealing sin and calling to repentance. And then, with a dab of the Holy Spirit's conviction, the cleaning process has begun. Soon, the tainted substances will be restored good as new. Timing may vary based on the substance affected and your eschatological viewpoint. Have a broken marriage? Redeem Now restores now. Through the Redeem Now process, our relationships to those we love most can be made into something that honors and glorifies Christ. Have a faulty self-image? Redeem Now restores now. No more sinful pride or crippling shame. Instead, you'll understand your true identity, made in the image of God and created for His workmanship. Redeem now. It restores now. <laughs> we, are, we are so happy they worked things out in their marriage. And uh, now that they're on staff, that's good to know. Uh, we should get that on our website, tech people on staff. Let's get that on there so we can see it again and pass it forward. I think. Some of these are so good, I think other churches can benefit from them too. So let's get them online. We are in the book of Isaiah today, and we're learning about God's message to his people. And in Isaiah chapter 1, he calls the whole earth to bear witness to Israel. And we learned that he said Israel is like a rebellious child. Israel is no smarter than a donkey or an ox, because a donkey or an ox knows their master, knows who takes care of them, but Israel does not know me. And they do not recognize me. He said, instead, you have blood on your hands. You have murdered the innocent. You have oppressed the vulnerable. And I'm holding you account. He says, I'm tired of your fake religion. I'm tired of your rituals. I will hide my eyes when you worship me. And you lift your hands and if your face to heaven. I will hide my eyes. I will turn my ears from your prayers because your hands are full of blood. From the top of the head to the soles of your feet, you are corrupt. That was the message, a strong message about sin and its consequences last week. And God is going to make an appeal to them in this passage, and that's what we're going to focus on today. I want to focus on those of you who might be here today who've never made a commitment to Christ. You're dealing with your sin in some other way. And I want to focus on you who have made a commitment to Christ who are doubting what God has done for you. So those are my two targets today as we speak. So let's pick up where we left off last week in Isaiah chapter 1. We'll read verses 16 through, and we'll come back and focus on verse 18 together. So now that we're in this corrupt state, what do we do? God says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat from the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken." I see how the faithful city has become a harlot. She was once full of justice and righteousness, used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Like, look how far you've fallen. Maybe sometimes we feel like that. Maybe we think about the days when we really were, you know, firing on all cylinders and just really growing spiritually. 
and serving. And we, sometimes we look at our lives now and we see drift. We say, look how far I've fallen. Look, look what I used to do. Look how I used to serve. And he says, look how far you've fallen, Israel, from what you used to be. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They all love bribes. They chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah, I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself from my enemies. Think about this. These are His people, and now they're acting as enemies. And God says, you're going to act like an enemy. I'll treat you like an enemy, right? I'll deal with you harshly. God says, if you're going to rebel against me, if you're going to fight with me, you're going to lose. I'm going to win. Righteousness will prevail. I will turn my hand against you. Now, here's the thing. You think we said, he's talking, he's going to say, I'm going to smite you good, right? You're going to be wiped off the face of the earth, but that's not what he does. He goes in a direction you do not expect him to go. Instead, he says, you like Sodom and Gomorrah, but he says, instead of wiping you out, here's what I'm going to do. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I'll restore your judges as in the days of old. Your counselors as in the beginning and afterwards, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. God's grace seen here in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you what you do not deserve. Zion will be redeemed with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. But for those who aren't penitent, those who aren't repentant, rebels and sinners will be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. That's still true. You will be ashamed of the sacred oaks in which you've delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens you have chosen. And so we will say right there, what, is God against nice trees? Is He against gardens? You know, like we have... uh, orchards for different purposes. This is one's for apples, and we have, you can go to a tree farm and you can harvest trees. They're grown to be Christmas trees, cut down. Israel, Judah at this time had these large harvest fields of trees for the worship of the fertility goddess Asherah. And so these oak trees were were grown for her for the whole purpose of this pagan worship. And God says, you're going to regret growing those trees and what you used all those acreages for in worshiping of these foreign gods. That's what that's a reference to. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become timber. The greatest man among you will become timber. His work, a spark. Both will burn together and no one to quench the fire. Very strong words. But right in the middle of the rebuke, is an appeal to reason. God says, let's talk about this. Let's talk about your condition, the state of your affairs. Verse 18 is our key verse today that we want to draw our attention to. In verse 18, God gives an invitation. He says to the rebellious, come now, let's reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, They shall be like, well, why did God evoke that image? Why does he mention color here? Why the color red is evoked? It is a direct correlation, direct drawback to the passage where he says, what? Your hands are full of blood. It's an image of somebody who's murdered somebody. And down in their hands is bright red blood because they've taken innocent life. They're a murderer. They've committed an egregious sin You said, I thought all sins were the same. That's not what the Bible teaches, by the way. I've heard that time and time again. All sins are the same. No, all sins are rebellion. All sins lead to separation from God. But there are levels of sin. And there are levels of consequence for sin. You know, Jesus talked about sin and he says, but if you hurt children, he says, it'll be better for the guy who hurts a child. It'd be better for that guy to have a millstone tied around his neck and be thrown in the midst of the sea. And when I'm done with him on Judgment Day. That guy who had the millstone thrown in the depths of the sea, he's going to have a better day than the guy that hurts children when I deal with him. Paul's talking in Corinthians about a sin. He goes, there is a sin among you Corinthians that is so bad 
that not even among the Gentiles do they sin like this to this level. A man has his husband, he's living with his stepmother. A man has his husband's wife. He goes, they don't even sin that badly. They don't even know God. And it's going on in your church and you're looking the other way. Jesus said there was a sin so bad called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that it cannot even be forgiven. There are levels of sin and consequences to sin. And he's saying, you're trying to minimize your sin. You're trying to compare yourself to other nations and say, we're not so bad, but your hands are full of blood. And so the reference to scarlet, the reference to crimson, refers back to that verse. He's saying, your rebellion has caused the death of innocence. People who should not have died have died on your watch. Your corruption, your sin is systemic. And it's time you take it serious. It's time you realize there's consequences for your actions. So come, let's reason together. Their problem is our problem. Their problem and our problem is humanity's problem. We're all in the same boat. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, no matter who you are, no matter how rich, no matter how powerful, no matter how famous. About a year ago, uh, you've heard of the National Prayer Breakfast. They have a speaker, and the president always speaks. Every congressman gets two tickets. They don't all go, but for those who go, they can invite two people. I was blessed to go last year. And so I'm sitting at this national prayer breakfast, and I'm starstruck. I'm looking around, and there's a lot of celebrities and powerful people. I'm like, at my table is an ambassador and a prime minister and a and congresswoman, and I'm feeling very intimidated and very inferior. I'm looking over here, and I said, oh, there's Roma Downey. I'm like, touched by an angel. There's Ben Zolbers, the MVP from the Cubs, the World Series. And I'm just like feeling very intimidated and unworthy. You know, the the king of Jordan's over here. You talk about wealth. The president and the vice president in a room not a whole lot bigger than this are dining right over here, eating the same thing I'm eating. That's powerful as it gets. But then I remember this. No matter how famous, no matter how rich, no matter how powerful, we all need Jesus. We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. And that's what it's teaching here. It's teaching the whole nation is corrupt. Their problem is our problem. What do we do? We all fall short. So what do we do? Well, if you're here today and you're not trusting in Christ... Here are some of the solutions that you have. And I'm going to give you this in an illustration that will help you remember. You're going to pretend that you're a teenager with me this morning. For some of you, that's going to be hard to do because it's been a while. Others of you are teenagers, so it's going to be kind of easy for you. But imagine you're a teenager and mom and dad just bought a brand new white couch, which is a mistake if you have teenagers. Mom and dad buy this white, she's very expensive, she saved a long time, and she says, I have one rule for the white couch, no drinks. I don't even want water. This is a very expensive couch. I've wanted a long time, and now that you're older, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to get this couch. So promise me, you will not drink anything, anything, even water on this couch. Scout's honor, I I promise, you know, I won't. Mom and dad leave, and you're a teenager, of course, so you know. You're pretty confident. You know better than mom and dad. I can drink on that couch and not spill anything. And so you reach into the refrigerator, and you pour a big glass of Welch's grape juice. (laughs) You sit down on the couch, and whoops, the dog jumps up, and there goes the Grape juice all over the white couch. (gasps) Oh, what am I going to do? You quickly Google, right? You Google, how do you get grape juice out of a, you know, and Google says, there's no hope for you. And you're like, oh, no, you know. (laughs) You try club soda, you try water, you just smear it around. And you just try everything that's in, you know, and you think, I can run away, but that's probably too drastic. You know, I could try to buy another couch, but I don't have that money. You know, what am I going to do? And so you just scrub. You try like every chemical, and you're just making it worse. It's changing into different colors now. It's spreading. Mom's going to see it, right? You know, so this whole scrubbing technique, the scrub, scrub, scrub technique, does not work. 
You know what it's called when you see the stain on your soul and you say, I'm going to work this off. I'm just going to work it off. I'm going to be a good person, do good things, and I'm just going to please God with my goodness. He's going to say, I'm so blessed to have you on my team. Look how good you are. Here's the problem, right? It's hard to get out of debt if you're always spending, <coughs> America, but it's hard, to, it's hard to get out of debt. You got to stop spending in order to get out of debt. And so here's what you do. If you're morally bankrupt, you're adding to your sin account every day. Instead of paying it off, you're adding to it. You know, because even our good deeds, the Bible says, are tainted with impure motives. And so all you're doing is accruing more debt. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 9, for by grace we are saved through faith, not by works. Not by works. Scrub, scrub, scrub doesn't work because you're just accumulating more debt. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you say, I've got to come up with another solution. Sometimes people have come up with what we call the swan song, you know, the swan dive, just give up. Just take a, just take a plunge into it. Just dive in. I might as well. You know, I, I, I can't get this out. I've already blown it. It'll never be white again. It'll never be pure again. So I might as well just go all in. And some of you have said, you know what? I've already blown it. I've already messed up. God can never forgive me of that. I'll never be white again. I'll never be pure again. So I might as well just jump in head first and take a swan dive into it. Might as well. You know, it's like mom comes home and she says, we'll never get that out. Forget it. I don't know why I buy nice things. So everybody can just drink whatever they want now. Go ahead. Drink the grape juice. Drink the coffee, the soda pop. Who cares? And years go by and there's just more and more and more stains because we just gave up. And there are some people who give up. They just can't live the life and so they just give up. But here's the problem. It leads to more bondage. You can go to one of our addictions. We have addiction groups in our church and there's some people there who've tried this and they'll tell you it doesn't work. It leads to more bondage. It leads to more slavery. Peter talks about this in his book. And he says, they promise them freedom. Oh, I'm just going to be free and do whatever I want to do. While they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. And that sin that thought you would give you freedom ends up controlling you and you become it's slave, and you know I speak the truth. And so the swan dive does not work. You just simply get buried deeper and deeper into sin. Well, what about another technique? Without the Lord, I have to do something about this stain. I, I think I'm going to try what's called the smoke screen. The smoke screen, I'm going to divert your attention away from the problem. I'm going to cover it up. I'm going to flip the cushion. I'll just flip the cushion and mom won't see it. Or I'll move the pillow when mom won't see it. Or, you know, I'm from old school, we used to have doilies on everything. I'll move the doily. Kids are like, what's a doily? And ask your parents. You move the doily and you cover it up. But sooner or later, mom cleans. Sooner or later, she flips the cushion. Sooner or later, the Bible says your sin will find you out. Proverbs says this. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Covered up is as old as the garden, but it doesn't work. You can't hide. It's still there, and sooner or later, its consequences and effects will bear out. You will reap what you sow. That technique of cover up, that technique of smoke screen, divert attention, works for the short term, but not for the long term. Oh, well, here's the solution. We'll do this one. It's called the side-by-side. -side. This is where you compare and minimize your sin. You, you look at the stain, you say, well, there's still mostly white there. <laughs> a little bit. Of, yeah, it's a stain there, but it's mostly white. You know, I, I got some sins, but I'm mostly a good person, right? And you compare. You know, I've been to Billy John Joe Bob's house, Mom. You should see their couch. It's terrible. There's stains everywhere, and it smells bad, and it's got rips and tears. We just got one stain here. We're not so bad. And you start comparing yourself to somebody else. You say, well, I'm no Mother Teresa, but I'm no axe murderer either. Well, aren't you a fine citizen to be better than an axe murderer? We are so proud of you <laughs> for that accomplishment. But here's the problem. The standard is not 
Mother Teresa. It doesn't say, for God, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Or it doesn't say, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of Mother Teresa. She's not the standard. The standard is the glory of God. That's what we fall short of. To sin is the word hamartia, which means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. You miss the mark. And if you miss the mark, it doesn't matter how much you miss the mark by, you miss the mark. You fell short of the target. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, His righteousness, His purity, His holiness. We all sin and fall short. So you can't compare yourself to somebody else and try to feel better. You compare yourself to God's standard of righteousness in which you fall woefully short. So the side-by-side, minimizing, comparing my sin, it doesn't work. You have blood on your hands, your scripture says. Your sin is as scarlet. Your sin is as crimson. So what are we going to do? The Bible has a better way, and it's called surrender. It's called surrender. Surrender looks like this. Mom, come, dad, come home, and you got to look ashamed, and you say, here's what I did. It's confession. Confession comes from the two Greek words, homo legeo, same word, to say the same thing that God says. Mom comes home and dad comes home and you say, I was wrong. I broke your rule. I thought I could keep it, but I couldn't. And so against your law and against your will, I brought in grape juice and I spilled it. And here's what I've done. And I feel bad and I'm sorry. If you want to ground me for life, I understand. If you want to use all my allowances to buy yourself a new couch, I'm okay with that. If I can work this off, but that's my bad choice. And I'm guilty. And I'm sorry. The Bible says that's the way to go. And maybe some of you here, you've never tried that. You've tried all these other techniques to remove sin, but you've never tried that. The Bible says that's the way to go. Because God has made a way. He's made a way for you to be free. He's made a way for you to come to Him. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you are, believe and are justified, and with the mouth you confess and are saved. You, you repent, you confess your sins, you acknowledge His Lordship. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. A new start, a son or a daughter of God. God has taken your sin upon himself in the person of Jesus Christ upon his cross, and only his blood can remove that stain. Only his death can remove that guilt. And your responsibility is to receive it, to acknowledge it. And some of you today are believers here, and you still question what God has done for you, you question your salvation. I want to address you for a moment as well. And I want to draw your attention to Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect in their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. Did you see that? Resting. Resting. What is rest like? Is rest anxious? Does rest make you tired? Does rest make you fret? You know, when I'm done, I, when I'm, I'm tired, and I go home, and I get in my recliner, and I put on the ball game, and, I, and I, I call the puppy to come up in my lap, and we recline together, and we just sometimes just fall asleep, or watch something funny, or watch the game. I'm resting, right? Whatever you do for rest, you're resting. God says, I want you to rest in my promise. Read I've said. Because of this, which God, who does not lie, he does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought the word to light through preaching. Entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. Notice he says, from God our Savior and from Christ Jesus our Savior, drawing a direct connection between Jesus as God. God our Savior, Jesus our Savior, God is one. God is our Savior. So, 
I want you to imagine today that on your way to church, you were late, and so you were speeding. And you were going quite fast, actually. And next thing you know, there's sirens, and then you see the cop car, and you pull over. The policeman's caught you dead to rights. He comes out of the car, and he says, can I see your license, please? You pull it off, and he says, you know what you're doing today? And you said, yeah, I, I was speeding. Yeah. Do you know how fast you were going? And you say, yeah, about 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. That's going to cost you big time. You're thinking about all the points it's going to cost, right? And he says, yeah, why were you speeding? And you say, to be honest, officer, I don't want to miss a minute of church. I don't want to even miss the opening songs. I want to be there for everything, and I'm running late. And so I was speeding today. I'm going 30 miles an hour. I don't normally speed, but I did today because I want to get to church, and I'm really sorry. Go ahead and write me up. The police officer looks at you, and he smiles. He says, that's refreshing. Normally people make up some sort of story, but you've told me the truth. And you're going to church too. So you must be a good person. And you say, yeah, I'm going to faith community. You can go with me next Sunday. <laughs> I just throw that in there. And he says, you know what I decided to do? 30 miles an hour, that, that's pretty high over. Don't tell my boss I'm doing this, but I'm going to let you off. I'm going to write you a warning. I don't want you to speed anymore, even if you're going to church, okay? Have a nice day. And he gives you the warning. What should you do at this point? Thank you. You know, wow. Drive away. But that's not what you do. You look at the ticket and you say, can I step out a minute, please? And he says, sure. He's watching you. He steps out and you grab a clinic and say, can I just shine up your badge, please? Can I start... Can I, so what, what, are you, what are you doing? Why are you showing my bad? You know, I just want to make up for the ticket. You know, I want to do something nice for you. I'm going to, uh, and you start going down to clean up his shoes a little bit, a little muddy. What are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to clean off your shoes because I thought maybe it'll help me get out of my ticket. Well, you don't have a ticket. So you grab a towel and you start cleaning off the squad car. I want to <laughs> clean this off. He said, why are you cleaning off the squad car? What are you doing? Are you, what's the matter with you? Well, I'm just thinking maybe if I do nice things that you'll let me out of this ticket. You know, it's a lot of money and those points. I don't want those points. And you go, he says, there's no ticket. I'm, I'm extending you grace here. I'm not giving you a ticket. And you start complimenting, boy, you look really nice in your uniform. That's very nice uniform. Very clean, very ironed and starched and very professional. Your squad car... Even inside is very clean. Your, your mom must be proud. It's very nice. Why are you flattering me like this? Well, I'm trying to say nice things in case you let me off the ticket. There's no ticket. And you pull out your checkbook and say, now, how, how, can I write you a check? Do you take cash? Can you get a credit card or debit card? You know, what, what do I do to make this go away? And he's exasperated with you. And he says, listen, I didn't lie to you. When I told you you have no ticket, you're free to go. And you think, well, that's too good to be true. That can't be true. And so I've got to work for it. I've got to pay for it. Friends, that's what it's like. God has said, listen, I have taken your debt and I've issued you a pardon. You're guilty as charged, but I have given you grace. And you go, oh, it can't be too good to be true. Got to be some way I can pay for that. I'll do nice things. I'll say nice things about God. I'll do good works. I'll clean the church. Whatever it is, I've got to earn it. And God says, you can't earn it. There's literally no charge anymore. The charges have been dropped. Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Christians, if you're here today and you're questioning what God has done for you and you're questioning your salvation, Titus, he says to Titus, relax, rest. Rest. Because God has made a promise to you, and God cannot lie. That police officer has no reason to lie, but he can lie. God has no reason to lie, and he can't lie. God has spoken his word to you. Rest in his promise today. I need to stop. We need to um, just issue this invitation. Some of you today have been coming to this church for a long time. 
And you, you came because a friend invited you. You came because, you know, you were seeking or whatever, and you're here. But you know in your heart you've never dealt with the stain on your soul. You've never dealt with it. You've tried all these other solutions. You've done the swan dive. That didn't work. You've, you've, tried, the, you've tried the comparison. You've tried to minimize. You've tried all kinds of things that haven't worked. How about trying what God has said? How about trying surrender today? I'm going to invite you today to give your life to Christ. This is harvest day for us. This is a day when you cross that line of faith. You know, I've been coming, I've been listening, I've been learning, I've been growing, but you've never made that decision. I invite you today to make that decision. Would you pray with me today? Everyone pray, but specifically those of you who've never made a decision for the Lord, pray this prayer with me. Today, Lord Jesus, I see the stain on my soul. And Lord, I've tried to remove it myself. I've tried to be a better person and it doesn't go away. Pray this prayer with me in your heart. I've, I've tried to compare it and minimize it, but it doesn't go away. I've tried to hide it and cover it up, but it doesn't go away. I've given up and sinned more and only gone deeper into sin. I've tried every way there is but surrender. So this morning, today, I surrender. I look at this stain in my soul and I say there is no earthly solution. They'll remove it. But I believe there's a heavenly one. I believe Jesus Christ came and died for my sin. That my stain was put upon him. And that he removed my stain of sin. He made my couch white. He, you have the ability to make my life clean again. To be a son or a daughter of God. And so today I come in faith. I believe in my heart Jesus is Lord. That he rose again on the third day. And that he can give me new life. And so I repent of my sin. And I ask for your Holy Spirit to come and live and reign and live through me. Today, Father, I want to become your son and your daughter. In Jesus' name. And Father, if anyone has prayed that prayer, and it was authentic, it was real, and they're broken, and Lord, what Titus has said is true. They can rest in the hope of eternal life. For God has made the promise and God cannot lie. I pray too for the believer that is tormented and wonders, do I really know that I have salvation? Do I really know that my sins are forgiven? Help them to rest in the promises you have given to them today. Lord, everyone in this room is a sinner and everyone in this room has missed the mark. We've fallen short of the glory of God and there are stains in our soul. There are things that we've done and said that we're ashamed of. But help us today to just humbly receive the grace and forgiveness and mercy and cleansing that comes from surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We hope you've enjoyed Truth For Today, brought to you by Faith Community Church. If you would like more information about attending our church, please call us at 608-758-2850, or you can visit us on the web at www.faithcommunitychurch.net. We'll see you next week at the same time, and thanks again for watching Truth For Today.